Hello everyone. In this lecture, we are going to talk about the signed particle formulation of quantum mechanics, in particular non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Uh, this is a brand new uh, formulation of quantum mechanics that was published only several months ago. And in this lecture, what I will try to do is to give you at least a rough idea what you can achieve with this formulation and what this formulation is about how we describe quantum systems in this brand new formulation. Um, everything that I will use in uh, this lecture are uh, based on papers that are published. Um, if you are interested in details that I am not giving in this lecture, you are strongly uh, advised to go through the papers that I am suggesting you, in particular the one that you see on the screen here which is the paper about the, the signed particle formulation of non-relativistic quantum mechanics. If for any reason you, you might find or you might have questions that are not answered in this paper, you are strongly advised and encouraged to contact me. It would be my pleasure to answer your questions. So please do not hesitate. So in this lecture, the topics will be more or less the ones you see on the screen. Uh, we will first discuss what, the, what formulations we have in quantum mechanics nowadays, what are the ones that are considered standard ones. Then we will introduce the sine particle formulation itself, very roughly, unfortunately, but at least uh, I hope you will, let, will, you will have at least an idea about what this thing is. And we will discuss the classical limit in this formulation just to show you at least one uh, advantage of using this formulation instead of others. We will then mention the Wigner Monte Carlo method based on sine particles because uh, this, this method is essentially a discretization of the formula of the sine particle formulation of quantum mechanics. So I would like to mention what the connections are between the formulation and the Monte Carlo method. And at the end, we will see a little bit of the benchmarks because it's always good to see that uh, the formulation works. So benchmarks are important. And we will conclude with, uh, with some comments on the directions this formulation could take in, uh, in the next future. So let's start from formulations of quantum mechanics. Um, it is no surprise that uh, quantum mechanics uh, um, appeared more or less 100 years ago when there were uh, the emergence of experiments which could not be explained in terms of, uh, of, of classical uh, objects, such as, let's say, Newtonian particles. And because of that, theoretical physicists eventually come up with uh, different ways of explaining these experiments that were puzzling a, a whole community. In particular, here you see the double slit experiment, which, which shows without any, any doubt of a shadow the, 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 the particle wave duality of matter. And at that time, there would have been no way to explain that by recurring essentially to only classical uh, concepts. So, Physicists came up with different formulations. Um, for example, uh, the one that we described here, the standard one, is the Schrodinger formulation. The Schrodinger formulation has the strong advantage of being uh, analytically treatable, which is something extremely important and which was something very important at that time because they didn't have uh, use uh, the, the use of, uh, of uh, computational resources. So the only way they could uh, uh, physicists could uh, uh, investigate and understand quantum systems was by means of analytical uh, analytical uh, treatment of formulas. So it is no surprising that Schrödinger became uh, very very quickly the standard in quantum mechanics. And in this formulation, it is well known that everything is explained by means of the web functions, which are complex objects, uh, which, are, which are also called uh, probability amplitudes. And what we do is to evolve in time this uh, web function. And by means of this heuristic Born rule, we can give the probability of finding particles inside an area of, uh, or let's say inside a device, for example, depicted uh, in, in our simulation or whatever we are interested in, in studying. And observables in this representation 
are given by means of operators which have to be unitary. So I'm not going to explain all these details. You can find them in, uh, in, standard, in standard books of quantum mechanics. All of this is very well known. And another fact that is very well known, and this is a very important fact, is that we have only two Schrodinger equations. We have only two models in this, in this formalism. We have a time-dependent model, which is known as the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, and it's essentially an initial condition problem. And we have the time-independent Schrodinger equation, which is also very well known, and this consists in solving an eigenproblem. Whatever you take, uh, whatever you want to study in this, in this formulation, the only equations that are correct and describe correctly the evolution of a quantum systems are these two equations. There are no other equations, so this is very important. So going ahead, uh, eventually, of course, physicists came up with a lot of different formal formalisms explaining uh, in, in a, let's say, different ways uh, quantum mechanics. Of course, all these formalisms are equivalent. Experimentally speaking, they give exactly the same um, predictions. So there is no way from an experimental point of view to make a difference between these formal formalisms. One could see this more or less as different mathematical expressions of the very same physical object. And they are always transformed that brings you from one formalism to another. For example, one that is very well known is that if you start from the Schrodinger formalism, for example, you can go to the Wigner formalism or you can go to the Feynman formalisms. And the way you do it is pretty uh, simple. And all these transform that brings you from one uh, formalism to another are always invertible. In a moment, we are going to discuss in particular the connection between Schrodinger and Wigner. So many of these formulations are very well known. For example, you have the, the oldest one, which is coming from 1925, given by Heisenberg, which is the, based on the, the concept of a density matrix. You have the Schrodinger one, which is nowadays the standard, was created a year after Heisenberg and is based on the concept of wave functions. We have, let's say, less well-known ones, for example, the Wigner one, which is which was uh, published in 1932 and is based on the concept of quasi-distribution functions. We have the Feynman one, which is uh, which was published in 1948 and is based on the path integral concept. And we have the Kelvish one, which is also known as a non-equilibrium green formalism, which is based on the concept of green functions. So among all these things, nowadays we also have now in 2015 the sine particle formulation. And this is exactly what I'm going to talk about. So let's see now what is this formulation about. So we will start from the Wigner equation. And by treating this Wigner equation in, uh, um, in a very specific way, we will obtain a set of postulates that give us a different perspective on, a, on, a, on the evolution, on the description of quantum systems. So this equation appeared in 1932. It is, uh, it is uh, essentially an equation that is totally equivalent to the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. And uh, the only difference being that in the Schrodinger equation you will describe uh, mathematically your systems in terms of probability ampli amplitudes or wave functions, while here you describe your systems in terms of an object that is defined on a phase space and known as a quasi-distribution function. We cannot, uh, or despite the resemblances with the, the Boltzmann equation or the Vlasov equation, we cannot really define this uh, function fw that you see on the screen here as a proper distribution function because we can show that this function of, as, a, as a negative peaks in several points of the web, uh, of the phase space. Uh, on the other side, it is possible to show that this formulation of quantum mechanics is completely equivalent to the Schrodinger formali uh, formalism. So it is not a semi-classical approach, anything like this. 
it's a full quantum approach that is completely equivalent to the Schrodinger approach. And there is a transform known as the wigner wright transform that brings you from the space of wave functions to the space of quasi-distribution functions and vice versa because uh, it is shown in several papers and in different ways that the wigner wright transform is an invertible uh, transform. So you have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the Schrodinger formalism and the Wigner formalism, and this is a very important fact. Um, then, okay, uh, what uh, model do we have then in the Wigner formalism? Well, the story goes exactly as in the Schrodinger formalism. You can uh, use only two uh, different equations. You can have the time-dependent Wigner equation, and you can have the time-independent Wigner equation. The time-dependent Wigner equation is the first equation you see on the screen here. Uh, it's a, a, an integral differential. Uh, it's a partial integral differential equation. As you can see, it's a very, very uh, complex uh, equation. It's uh, almost impossible to treat it analytically. Uh, although we can say something for very, very simple cases. And the time-independent Wigner equation is more or less uh, an eigenproblem, although it's not exactly an eigenproblem, but in the spirit is, is exactly the same thing. And what is very, very important here again is that as it happened with, with Schrodinger, the same thing happened with Wigner. You cannot use different models. If you want to use the time-dependent regime of a, of, a, of a quantum system, you will have to use the full time-dependent Wigner equation. And if you want to study the stationary regime of your quantum system, you will have to use the time-independent Wigner equation. If you use anything different than that, you are essentially using a wrong model. If you are taking one of these models and you are dropping, for example, uh, let's say uh, partial derivative and, for example, the time uh, partial derivative, uh, you come up with models that are not physically sound. They don't describe the, 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 the physical evolution of your system anymore. This is a very important point. So the, another important point, and uh, this is uh, shown in the paper that is, uh, that is uh, cited on this slide, is that nowadays we also have an, uh, an area of experimental physics called quantum tomography, where people can essentially uh, measure uh, the Wigner function. So this is an extremely important point, because it means that you can, you can immediately uh, compare whatever you, you have uh, from a, a numerical point of view or from a theoretical point of view with a real experimental measurement of the quasi-distribution function of your system. And I would say this is a very, very strong advantage. Uh, so let's now discuss a little bit about the postulate of the sine particle formulation of quantum mechanics. I am not going to go through uh, the details about how we came up with these postulates. If you want to see the details, you have to go through the, the paper that I cited at the beginning. But more or less, the story goes like this. You can take the, the time-dependent Wigner equation and rewrite it in terms of a Fredholm equation of second kind. And out of this, you will uh, end up with a with um, a physical interpretation of, uh, let's say, a statistical ensemble of particles which can have a positive or a negative sign. And this is more or less what postulate one is telling you. The postulate one essentially is telling you that uh, instead of using wave functions or instead of using, let's say, uh, green functions or path integrals, you could equivalently describe quantum systems in terms of virtual Newtonian particles, which are fieldless, and we will see this in a minute, and which are provided uh, simultaneously with the position and the momentum. The only difference, let's say, with, uh, with uh, Newtonian particles or proper Newtonian particles would be represented by the fact that these particles now carry a sign. Uh, another postulate will tell you that if you have two of these particles with opposite sign but staying in the same phase space coordinates, so they have same position and same momentum but opposite sign, 
they annihilate, they disappear from the calculations you are doing. And finally, the last postulate here, which is postulate two, but I, I put it at the, uh, at, uh, the last because there is a lot to say. Uh, postulate two is telling you how these sine particles evolve. So supposing that you have a potential uh, V that is defined over your configuration space, okay? And in this case, the configuration space coincides with the real space. Uh, your sine particles will behave according to uh, a new function that uh, I personally call here a gamma. And this, uh, this, uh, this gamma function will tell you what's the probability for a sine particle to create a new pair of sine particles. And the way the, this gamma function is calculated is on the screen. Um, please note that the integral that you have in formula, in formula 1 here is a not a Riemann integral. This is a new definition of integral, which I personally call a momentum integral, uh, because it's a very, very similar in spirit with the path integrals, where path integrals would span over the set of uh, possible uh, paths. And your, your momentum integral here is instead spanning over the space of momenta. And the definition is given in, on the second part of Formula 1. It's also interesting that exactly as it happens in the path integral formulations, uh, there is no way to ensure, to assure that these limits you see on the screen will eventually uh, converge. And there is still a lot of investigation going on here because probably the conditions that tell us when this thing is converging are going to tell us a little bit more about the physics uh, involved in the system in, uh, in, in, in quantum systems. Okay, and eventually the, the, the last part of the postulate two here is telling you, okay, you create two new sine particles, which are the same position of the parent particle, and the way you calculate, the way you calculate the momentum of these new particles is essentially given by um, a normalized probability that is the one you see on the bottom of this, uh, of this uh, slide. And to make things much, much uh, simpler and to give you a rough idea about the physical picture that this new formulation gives uh, to us, uh, we could think about quantum systems now uh, described by means of ensemble of these sine particles which behave just as fieldless classical point particles. So once they have an initial momentum, this momentum doesn't change in time. And somehow you could see them as not feeling the, 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 the potential, okay? But the only interaction that happens with the potential is by means of creation, creation or creating new uh, particles which are signed. So this is somehow the new, the new uh, physical picture that this new formulation gives us. And a possible implementa implementation would be these 10 steps that you see on the screen here. But if you are interested in uh, seeing exactly how this thing works, and if you are interested in a practical implementation that is ready to go, you can use it right away. It's very easy to compile and to run it. Just go on uh, on nanoarchimedes.com and you will find you will find uh, the code for single body systems and for two body systems. So you can also have a flavor about uh, how to um, to tackle many body problems. And by many body problems, I mean in a time dependent fashion. Uh, the classical limit of this formulation is uh, pretty simple to explain. Uh, we, we could uh, essentially go and say that there are two cases. Uh, the first case would be free space, so when we don't really have any potential applied. And the second case would be when we have an external potential applied to the system. The first case is rather trivial, because if your V is identically, uh, identically zero, then the Wigner kernel, this function you see here, VW on the screen, will be identically zero, and consequently your gamma function, which is the probability of creating particles, will also be zero, will also be identically zero. So which means that 
uh, when you don't have any potential applied, your sine particles just coincide with the usual Newtonian last particles with a positive sign. And um, practically, there is no creation of uh, uh, sine particles. This is prohibited by the fact that the function gamma is identically zero. Now, in the second case, if we take uh, if we are in the presence of an, uh, any external potential, what can we say? Well, first of all, we have to rewrite uh, the, the Wigner kernel in a more, uh, let's say, convenient mathematical way, which is provided by this, uh, this substitution of variables you see on the top of the screen. And on the bottom of the screen, you see how this Wigner kernel would eventually look like. So there is nothing difficult so far. But then, if you take into account that your uh, potential can be expressed in terms of a, of a Taylor series, then you can rewrite the whole Wigner kernel in the way you see on the screen and eventually get rid of every term that is too small to be uh, influenced, uh, to have any influence in the calculation of the Wigner kernel. This is exactly what we do here. So we eventually keep only the first term of the series, and what we get is approxim approximately um, what you see on the on the first formula on the screen here. And because of this, your gamma function will be the limit you see on the bottom of the screen, where the plus sign that you see there uh, stays for the positive part of the argument between the square uh, parentheses or uh, square brackets. So if we go ahead now and we take the positive part of this thing, this would bring us to say that this uh, integer n here uh, would, would have to be, um, let's say, in the range between 0 and this expression you see on the screen here. But then it becomes uh, pretty natural that for h bar tending to 0, this would be equivalent to say that n is 0, which is uh, uh, at the end equivalent to say that uh, the creation of sine particles is forbidden in classical limit, which is exactly what you would expect. And from the paper, you can also uh, check and see that you also obtain the Newtonian laws of, uh, of, uh, of uh, classical mechanics again. So somehow you see that the, the the, um, the classical limit here is, uh, is uh, different than whatever you can see in other formulations, and it's a pretty interesting uh, story over here. It's a very different, you have a very, very different perspective uh, on something that is as, as old as quantum mechanics. So uh, it is a very interesting uh, point of view. So to summarize what we, we have said here concerning the classical limit, uh, we will see, I mean, in the classical limit, there will be no creation of sine particles. The gamma function always goes to zero, or h bar going to zero. Um, the particles are not fieldless anymore. Their, their equation of motion just coincide with the second law of Newton again, which is, of course, what you would expect. Negative particles are not allowed any longer when you go to the classical limit, which is, of course, something else that you would strongly expect. And as we already said, the equations of motion coincide with Newton's law again. So this is a pretty, pretty convincing um, set of evidences that we now have a, a new formulation that is giving us something different, but at the same time is giving us uh, the, correct, the correct answers when we are talking in terms of classical limits. Um, a very, very interesting uh, thing is that uh, the sine particle formulation is, of course, defined on a continuum phase space. And, but if we restrict the sine particle formulation uh, over, let's say, a finite and semi-discrete phase space, then we immediately obtain what is known as the sine particle Wigner Monte Carlo method. So one can see the Wigner Monte Carlo method based on sine particles essentially is just as a restriction of the sine particle formulation. Uh, th therefore, while the formulation itself is brand new, it has been published only a few months ago, 
its numerical discretization has already been tasted in the last three years, and I would say in a very, very uh, detailed way. So this means that we have now a formulation and we already know that numerically speaking, this thing works very well. If you go through the, the list of papers you find on nanoarchimedes.com, you will see that it has been already applied to a plethora of different situations. Some of them are uh, theoretically interesting. Some of them are technologically interesting. And literally, this method works like a charm on both situations. So I strongly suggest you to go there and, and check the literature. You, you will be amazed. Uh, and what I would like to, see, to say also is that one might feel uncomfortable with the idea that the formulation came up after the discretization or the, 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 the numerical method. But if you go through the paper of Feynman 1948, the one that is essentially presenting to the world the path integral formulation, you will really see that the same process has happened in the mind of Richard Feynman. Indeed, you will see that essentially the whole approach is first of all described, depicted in terms of discrete mechanics. And at the, only at the end, you go to the continuum limit. And somehow this is very, very similar to the, the, the history of the development of the sign particle formulation. So I would say from this perspective, there is nothing under the, nothing new under the sun. If you go through the paper, you will be amazed. It's very, very, very similar development. And okay, so if you are interested then in a, in the numerical implementation of the, the sign particle formulation, I strongly suggest you to go through this paper, an introduction uh, to applied quantum mechanics in the Wigner Monte Carlo formalism. This was published also very recently in uh, physics reports. Um, if you cannot find this paper for one reason or another, again, I strongly suggest you, I strongly advise you, or encourage you to contact me. No, no problem. I, I will definitely share the papers with you. So let's see now some example. First of all, let, let's see just the ballistic case. So uh, what you see now on the screen is a face base. And this is the evolution of a Gaussian wave packet going through a wet space, uh, sorry, for the phase space in time. There is no applied potential, nothing fancy. It's just a ballistic phase uh, without any external potential. And what you would expect is essentially this thing going uh, through space and spreading. And this is exactly what we see here on the screen. Uh, the details are explained in, in the paper. But if we go ahead now and in the middle of the uh, of the the, uh, the the domain, we put let's say uh, something like a barrier, which is uh, put exactly on the red line that you see on in the phase space here. You will start to see typical quantum effects happening. And in this particular case, uh, what you will see is that uh, because of the height of the barrier. You will have your, your initial wave packet or your initial Gaussian wave packet that will split in two packets. One will tunnel through the barrier and the other one will reflect. Uh, and the very, very interesting thing that you see uh, at the end of the simulation here is that very, very clearly in the, in the phase space, you can see that you have two packets that somehow are entangled. Because you see very strong, uh, very strong oscillations happening in the middle of the, of the, um, of the, the phase space here. And this is exactly what you would expect if your formulation were, or your numerical method would, would be correct. So this is a very strong evidence that this method is correct and giving you the right answers. And just to further benchmark this thing, if we now put a very, very high barrier, what you would expect is that you, We'll still have some tunneling, but not so much. You should definitely see your wet packet reflecting back. And this is exactly what we see here again in the phase space. In particular here, what is uh, very, very interesting is that you, you clearly see that the momentum of the wet packet is changing from positive to negative. So it's getting back 
uh, it's really reflecting and all of this is very very clear in the phase space i couldn't see i couldn't say the same if we are in the configuration space for example so this is also another very strong point uh, in favor of this formulation and its numerical method so what are the conclusions well first of all everything is quantum so possible applications are infinite I hope you guys find this uh, method interesting um, and you will find a, a plethora of situations where to apply this. Actually, if you find situations where you can apply successfully this method, I would be more than happy to know what they are. So I strongly encourage you to contact me if you, if you find something interesting. And further development of the theory will be, well, the many body approach is still under construction, although the Wigner uh, many body, uh, Monte uh, sorry, the many body Wigner Monte Carlo approach already exists, but its limit to the continuum doesn't exist yet. So this would be one thing. And of course, it would be extremely interesting to include the variable of a spin. Uh, because nowadays we have a lot of uh, applications which uh, try to exploit uh, uh, the spin and some of, uh, of, of them uh, successfully exploit spin. So it would be extremely interesting to see also how to include the spin in this formulation. And if you guys are interested in more literature or seeing how to contact me, or if you want to develop a ready-to-go code, just go on Nano Archimedes. You will find plenty, plenty of material you can use in order to understand this formulation, in order to understand its numerical discretization. And you will also find the code, which is also a very, very important point if you want to start from something. So I thank you very much for your attention. I really hope that you like this new formulation of quantum mechanics. Thank you.